you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Uh, hi, folks. It's Foss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. The ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the greatest show on earth. For 15 years, two to three times a weekday, we bring you the podcasts of billionaires, CEOs, entrepreneurs, newsmakers, and the hottest authors that come on to talk shop. And we have one today. Who knew? Uh, it's showtime, baby. <laughs> Welcome to the Chris Voss Show podcast. The family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law. You never should have spilled that thing on her on her carpet. She will never forgive you. Anyway, we have an amazing gentleman on the show, as always. And, uh, you know, we have the brightest minds on the show, which is all the more reason you should uh, invite your family and friends to subscribe to the podcast because uh, you're going to have to spend Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving dinner with them here in a couple months. And you know what? They're not as bright as you think they are, or maybe you already know that. So tell them to go to goodreads.com, Fort says Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, Fort says Chris Voss, YouTube.com, Fort says Chris Voss, and Chris Voss one on the uh, tickety talkety channel over there with the children or the kids or whatever the hell's going on over there these days. Uh, he is the author of the latest and newest book that comes out October 3rd. 2023 you can pre-order this book and of course put this on your christmas buying list uh buy like five or six of them that way when someone gives you a gift that you didn't get them a gift because you don't care about them uh you won't feel embarrassed and you just go hey i got this great book that's going to be awesome and change your life the book is entitled level up how to get focused stop procrastinating and upgrade your life rob dial joins us on the show today and he has led an amazing, fun-filled life throughout his history, and we're going to be talking to him about uh, everything he's done and what he's doing. Rob is a podcaster, a speaker, and high-performance coach. He's one of the most influential leaders in personal development. He and his work have been featured in major media outlets such as Forbes, Inc., and Men's Journal. He is the host of the number one mindset podcast in the world, The Mindset Mentor which has been downloaded over 250 million times. And he lives in Austin, Texas, to top it off. And now he joins us on the Chris Foss Show. Welcome to the show, Rob. How are you? Hey, man, I'm great. That was, uh, that was an experience. Normally, I don't. when someone just interviews me, they're like, oh, I'll do the intro later. But that was great. There's a whole experience with your intro right there. Yeah, there's some of it we just kind of make up as we go along. Is a this is always something different it. and improv in the ramble. So uh, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Congratulations for the new book. Give us the dot coms or uh, plugs wherever you want people to find you on the interwebs. Yeah, I mean, if they want to get it, they can go to robdial.com slash book and pre-order it there. And then uh, if they love podcasts, like they probably love yours, it's uh, everything that's under the mindset mentor in the podcast area. There you go. They hate mine, but they just call in to see what the car crash is going to be for the day. And they're just like, look at this. This is a mess. Who did this, Chris? Anyway, it was me. Uh, so uh, what motivated you to want to write this book, Rob? Is this your first book? It is. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. Like, I don't, I don't enjoy writing. And writing a book is a, a labor of love. And it's a, it was a three-year process for me. We were talking right before mm. we started. It was a, uh, a process that took me three years to do. And, uh, and for me, it was like, I, the podcast is easy for me because I can sit down, I can come up with ideas and I can just talk about different things. You know, I'm, I, I put out four episodes a week as well. And so it's like, I put them out and I, sometimes I talk about anxiety. Sometimes I talk about success, money mindset, all of that. But like, I got this feeling in about 2020 where I was like, I, I really, I want it to be like a step-by-step -step process where if somebody like picks this thing up, they'll figure out how to work on their life. And I didn't want to write like a self-help book. Like I don't, I don't like being called a motivational speaker. I don't, you know, I'm in self-development is the category that I'm in, but a lot of times I think when I read self-development books, there's not like actual tangible stuff that's in it sometimes. Like it's good, but it's not everything that, that you, there's a part of us that's a little bit, is this real? Is this backed in science? And so for me, it's like, there's a lot of science that's in here. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of is I actually hired neurologists to actually go through and tell me if some of the stuff I was in here was incorrect or correct. And we have 
literally eight pages of cited psychological studies to prove all of the stuff that we say inside this book from you know start to finish um, is true. And it's it's backed in science. And so I we, we're born with like the most most incredible piece of machinery in the world, which is our mind, but we don't know how to use it. And so I want to create a book of like, this is exactly what you need to do to, to level up your life. There you go. You got the science, as they like to say. The kids say that. No, they don't. Like mm -hmm. science to back it up. So there you go. The science of life, the science of leveling up. So you call the book Level Up. What does leveling mm -hmm. up mean in your terms, in, in, your, in your thought process? Well, yeah. So it, it was, it's been a couple different names. One of them was originally like the whole idea of the book is how to take action. Like when mm -hmm. I look at majority of my podcast episodes, it's how to actually trick yourself into taking action. How do you understand your brain to see why it's holding you back? But the reason why we settled on level up was because I like to look at life as like a video game where mm -hmm. if you play a video game, it'd be really boring to play a video game where it's the exact same level every single mm -hmm. time and there's no challenges. And so when I look at my life, I look at my life like a video game and every challenge that comes in, same way that when you fight, you're on level one, you go and fight the bad guy you are going to lose a few times. And eventually when you do get challenged and you do succeed, you go on to the next level, which is a little bit harder, but you get better. And it's a little bit harder and you get better. And so I like to remind myself that when things get really challenging in life, whether it's challenges that is thrown at me by some other force or challenges that I go out and actually seek, every one of those challenges is, is designed for me to level up and, and evolve as a human. And so we settled on level up because it, it, I view life like a video game and it's like, Hey, here's the actual step-by-step -step process of how to try to master this video game that you're in. There you go. I think of my life as a video game, but I keep having to buy all these damn season passes and these, uh, <laughs> re, 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 re rolled, re masked, re skinned, uh, life things. And, uh, I don't know, man, I got, uh, my life is kind of like battlefield 2024. It just really didn't launch well. <laughs> All right, you, don't, you don't get to pick the video game you're in you just know that you're in the video game you know damn it and i'm stuck in mario kart uh so give That's us right. a hero's journey give us a hero's journey you didn't have to agree with me rob <laughs> it's like yeah you are you're, you're in mario kart you're not in call of duty you're in mario kart you're just screwed which is your hey, your mario kart's a classic game. like if there's one video That's game true. i want to go back to it's probably <laughs> mario kart that one's always good there you go there you go. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I'll, I'll think better of my life now. See, you're already helping me level up here. Uh, so give us a hero's journey for you. Uh, uh, how what was your upbringing? How did you come through life? How did you get to where you are today? Maybe, what, maybe what started the podcast and then uh, helping people with their mindset? Yeah, I'll try to give you a quick journey. So um, I was raised in Florida. I live in Austin, Texas now, but I was raised in Florida. And um, my father was an alcoholic when I was a kid. So my mm -hmm. parents got divorced when I was nine years old from him being an alcoholic. Um, he eventually passed away when I was 15 from being an alcoholic. And so a lot of trauma came from that. And uh, mm -hmm. we weren't, we didn't really have any money. My mom applied for food stamps, but couldn't get food stamps because she had a car. And for some reason you can't get food stamps. You have a car. I didn't understand that, but so we were, we were not in a good, good place. And, and so therapy was not something that we could go and just buy. And mm -hmm. when I discovered in, in, in 2019, I, I, um, sorry, 2006, I applied to work at a company called Cutco. I sold Cutco knives in people's houses and, oh. um, literally almost like door to door. And the one thing that they're really, really big on in that company is personal development, hiring mm -hmm. coaches, working yourself, reading, going to conferences. And a lot of people don't like that. For me, I, I saw it as like, oh my God, I could actually improve myself. Like I can almost, not that, I think everybody should go to therapy at some point, but I was almost like, oh, I can kind of kind of become my own therapist and start to work on myself. Um, so I was with that company for a while. I got promoted to run my own office in Fort Lauderdale. I ran all of Broward County. Um, I trained over 2000 sales reps when I was there by the time I was 24. And uh, I was training them how to sell knives, but really what I was doing is I was training them on their mindset, training them on who they were and how to become better. And when I left that company and went into other sales jobs, I, uh, I just missed teaching people. Like that was the thing I missed the most. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had uh, knowledge in my head of things that have helped me improve my life. And I felt kind of obligated to teach it, but I didn't really have a forum to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. What I did have though, is I did have a computer and I did have this microphone right here because huh. I was a musician. So I had the microphone and I, I was in Jason's deli with my girlfriend at the time, wife now back in 2015. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna start a podcast. And she's like, 
all right. And you know, podcasts weren't really a big thing back in 2015. It wasn't a way to make money or, but I was like, I feel Wait, there's money in this. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's some money in it. Right. I feel like I can, uh, I feel like I'm obligated to teach the things that have helped me. And the thing I missed was teaching people. And so I started the podcast and it, it started growing and growing. And then, you know, it was, it was, it did well for a really long time. And then 2020 hit and it was just like a hockey stick. And I think I was just in a, an industry where people would go to iTunes and type in mindset. And they were like, I want to listen to this. And some people like it and some people didn't like it. And the people who liked it kind of stuck. And it's been, it, w- it was like a, a massive growth at that point in time. And now it's this, it's, I'm like, I'm humbled because it's become this huge thing that I didn't think it was going to become, but I have this platform now where I feel um, humbled that people follow me and they like the stuff that I say, but I also feel very obligated to continue to keep working on myself to give them new things to work on. There you go. Hey, hang on one second. Hey, th- this guy says I'm supposed to get paid for this crap. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot uh, of money out there. You're going to go get it. I want $5. I'm going on union strike <laughs> like the auto workers. Hi, folks. Here's Foss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching speaking and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements, if you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer, and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff. Uh, With over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO, and be sure to check out Chris Voss Leadership institute.com now back to the show uh but you're obviously doing very well you're inspiring a lot of people you're motivating a lot of people they're obviously downloading the podcast and all that stuff and they'll be scooping up your book let's dig into the book some uh there's a lot of things that you talk about in the book uh uh, you start out with fear and uh what holds us back from achieving our goals let's delve into that a little bit and give us some teasers if you would please yeah. So when I was writing the, like I told you, the, the original title of the book was take action. That's what I wanted to do was like take action, but taking action doesn't sound really sexy. So leveling up sounds a lot sexier. That's why I settled on that one. And, um, and I started breaking down before I was thinking to myself, before I teach people how to take action, I'm really curious why people don't take action. We should probably talk about that first. So there's three parts of the book. Part one is why you don't take action. Part two is how to take action. Part three is how to actually use neuroplasticity and science to change your brain to make taking the action that you want to habitual. And um, the first thing when you dive into fears, people usually don't take action because they're afraid of something. And what's mm. really interesting is when you look at fear, you can then take fear. And I try to make things as simple as possible. Like That's the one thing I try to do as much as I can. When you look at fear, there's two different types of fears that I break down. There's primal mm. fears, which, uh, which is, means that there is pain, like physical pain or death attached to it. But in oh. 2023, there's not a lot of physical pain or death that's omnipresent like it was for our ancestors. On the other side of that, our amygdala still creates fears in our life. So we go to intellectual fears, which is the fear of judgment, the fear of abandonment, the fear of uh, success, the fear of failure, not being good enough, losing your job. There's all of these fears that come from that. And um, it's really interesting because when you look at intellectual fears, they're not physical. They're not like they're in reality. You know, if you're, if you're mm-hmm. looking at primal fears and a primal fear might be like, there's a tiger that's physically there in your reality. The, the presence of possible pain or death is physically there in your reality. When you mm-hmm. look at intellectual fears, none of them are actually in front of your reality. They're not there. Mm-hmm. And the, the biggest thing that really shifted my mindset around fears is I was listening to a, uh, spiritual teacher that around the time I was writing this episode, uh, not that episode, that, uh, that chapter. And, um, he said something I put inside the book and he said, most people ask, how do you overcome fear? Cause we've identified our fear. That's the first step. And then we go, well, how do I get rid of it? How do we overcome it? And, uh, I put it in the book, he says, you can't over some overcome something that doesn't exist. And so we have to realize like none of our fears that are actually holding us back intellectually are actually really present in this moment. It's a mm-hmm. projection of our mind into the future of thinking of something that might happen. And so it is a it is a, a, a projection of this might happen. And so because that might happen, I'm just gonna not take any action anyways. And so when you look at the fear of failure, you could really get deep into be like, well, what is failure? What is what is success? What is all of, are all of these things? And you can't physically hold them. They're not tangible in this world, which means if they're not tangible in this world, where are they? 
They're literally all in our minds. And so what we're doing is we're creating the boogeyman and then fighting the boogeyman our, our entire day. When in reality, if we turn the lights on, we're like, oh, I'm the only one in this room. And you mm -hmm. realize that you're actually the one that's in your own way by creating these fears that don't actually exist in reality. And it's a battle that a lot of people are in. If they can just remove themselves from realizing that those fears, you know, remove themselves from the fear and realize that it's not present right now and it never will be, um, it makes it a little bit easier to start to work through from there. And that's the first step to it. There you go. It's always good to take the first step. You know, primal fear with the tigers is just uh, in life or death situations, scenarios. Uh, that's what we call Fridays around here. So, you know, yeah, that's fun. it. You got, you got tigers that come around on Fridays. Today is Fridays. You're trying to get there. We go to Vegas. That sounds like a, yeah. sounds like one of those jokes. Who are those two guys in Vegas back in the old days? That was interesting. Yeah, they were uh, um, Siegfried and Roy. Siegfried and Roy. Yep. And, uh, don't do that, kids. Uh, so uh, the identity trial is one of the things you talk about in helping people achieve goals, dealing with their fear. I thought this was pretty interesting. Can you share out some uh, teasers on that? So, yeah, fears will hold you back. Another thing that will hold you back is your identity. And so, like, for instance, we'll make it really easy. I like to talk about about physical fitness or health just in general because it's physical. You can see it. You know, a lot of stuff in your mind you can't see. And so with physical journey, if somebody says, you know, I want to lose 50 pounds, they can want that. But a lot of people have the identity of, well, I've been overweight my entire life. It's impossible. Or, mm -hmm. you know, it's just in my genes. I, I'll never be physically fit because it's in my genes to be overweight. And if my identity is it's never going to happen, why would I ever take the action to try to make it happen? And so we can consciously want something. We all consciously want many things. But your conscious mind is only about 5% of actually what's going on in your head. Your subconscious is 95% of it. So your subconscious is 95% stronger. And with your identity, your identity is going to feed into your actions. So whatever actions you do or do not take, mm -hmm. your actions are going to feed into your results. And your results are going to feed back into your identity and either strengthen that identity of like, yeah, see, you worked out for a week and you didn't lose any weight. So you might as well just stop. And that feeds back into your identity, either strengthens the identity or you lose a few pounds and go, oh, wait, maybe I can do this. And it starts to actually test the, the identity that you have. Because for a lot of us, a lot of people that I find is, is we think that we are who we are, when in reality, who we are is just a choice that we make every single day. And when you look at like your personality, the actual root word for personality is persona. And persona was actually the mask that they used to wear on stage at theater in, in the Greek years. So Greeks would wear a persona on their face. And so we think to ourselves, like, I am who I am. Uh, but in reality, it's, that's not true. You can change yourself at any moment. And one of my favorite quotes around that is Alan Watts uh, always said, you're under no obligation to be who you were five minutes ago. And so we can look at it and say, to have a fixed mindset and say, hey, this is who I am. This is who I'll always be. And that's my identity. Or we can look and say, hey, I can change myself at any moment. I'm just going to decide to be somebody different today and try that identity on for a day. See how it fits. If we have an identity of I'm shy, you can be shy if you want to. Or you can say, today I'm going to be somebody who's outgoing and try to start talking to people who are behind you at Starbucks and even get into a conversation. And if you like that identity, keep it. If you don't like that identity, go back to your old one. And you can change it as, as often as you change your shirt if you really want to. There you go. Now, can I change my identity when the bill collectors call? And I can be like, hey, I, uh, that Chris Voss, uh, he's not living here anymore, eh? I'm the new guy. Yeah. And I mean, you uh, could, but they're price. probably still going to hunt you down. You got to move. You probably got to move <laughs> houses if that's, if that's the case. Now, how do I get this new identity to have a social security? New so nah, anyway, whatever, man. It just jokes here, people. Don't do that. I'll get calls from the social security division. Uh, no, but I love this idea because uh, identity is a major form for us. And people don't realize, you know, so they sometimes they think, like you said, they're they're locked into it. And and that's what they have. And they, they have a hard time getting out of it. It kind of boxes them in in a way, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. And limits I mean, their... Uh, your identity can either be... Yeah, it could be either be freeing for you or it could be just a construct that you have built. So I always mm -hmm. tell people like, like I'm in a room and the room is probably, our studio is probably 14 feet by 14 feet. And if you look at it and you're like, okay, well, what could I do in this room? Well, I could, you know, I could change this in this room to, I could obviously use it as a studio. I could transition into a living room. I could... Um, Only fans. You know, turn it into a tiny little theater. <laughs> yeah, I could turn it into a tiny little theater if I want to. But if I were to ask you, ask myself, like, could I, could I hold the entire Super Bowl in this room? The answer is no. And the reason why is because it's too small. But if I went to, like, I went to the Super Bowl this past year in Glendale, you know, mm -hmm. 70, 80,000 people that are there, 
why can I have the Super Bowl there? Well, it's just larger. And then you say, well, when yeah. in that larger place, what could I do? I could have a, you know, we could watch the Super Bowl. We could have another game. We could have, you know, Garth Brooks come and play inside of that. There's a lot more things you can do the more expansive that a space is. And so when you have an identity, an identity can be really restrictive. And it's like these mm -hmm. four walls that are around me where it's like, oh. I've built myself into these four walls and I, I live in these four walls and I can't get outside of it. And, and when you, when you have those four walls up and you're your limited self and you're trying to become the greatest version of yourself, you can only become the greatest version of your limited self. And so really what you have to start identifying is what are the walls I'm building around myself of this fake identity that I think are true? Do I want to stay this way or do I want to change it? And if somebody decides they want to change it, well, then at that point, you really have to figure out what walls you want to take down, what new walls you want to put up and realize that you're not some little being that is in 14 by 14 walls. You are expansive and can be as expansive as you want to be. That sounds like my belt line. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's never slowed down my belt line. My belt lines must have read your book early on because it's like that's, we're that's going expansive after Taco Tuesday. We're going to expand. We're going to uh, continue to expand forever. It's like the universe, okay. right? Just continues to expand yeah. forever. <laughs> yeah, that's the analogy I'm using when people are like, are you bigger now? I'm like, shut the fuck up. Uh, one of the analogies you have that I really liked was live in the headlights. This sounds like Saturdays yeah. at my house in Vegas. Uh, what what does it mean to live in the headlights? And does it sound like something where we should play chicken with uh, cars like that? Uh, what was that one movie with the bald headed guy and they race cars everywhere? I don't know. Live in the headlights. I don't, know. I don't remember. I don't know if I've seen that one. It's. Uh, it, I'll give you. I'll give you an example in real life of of how you could use it. So, like for me, people sure. keep asking with with interviews for this book, like, how did it come about? What did it look like? And mm -hmm. so, living in the headlights is a lot of people get paralysis by analysis. So like we set a goal, mm -hmm. we want to go for that goal. We want to figure out what that goal is going to be and start working towards it. But when you think of all of the things that you need to do to get there, there's a lot of things that you need to do. So like I live in Austin. If I want to drive to Houston, it'll take me about three hours. When I get in my car at night, I can't see the entire route to Houston. All I can see is whatever my headlights are lighting up in front of me. And so once I get past those hundred feet though, I can see the next hundred feet and then I can see the next hundred feet. So like even writing this book, like I don't like writing it. I didn't enjoy having to sit down and write the book in the process of it. But what happened was in 2020, I called up my friend and I was like, Hey man, he's a, he's a, got a huge book. They've sold almost 3 million copies at this point. And I was like, I'm thinking about writing a book. What should I do? And it was like the first little bit of hundred feet of headlights in front of me. I didn't see the whole route of the last three years, but mm. he was like, I'll get you on a phone with my book agent and you can see if it, if he likes it. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. He's, sends me a text. I, we text, we got into a phone call eventually. He's like, yeah, this is a great idea. We should do it. I call up another one of my friends who had just had a book come out and I was like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? He's like, yeah, you should definitely, here's a couple tips to help you get better on it. And what happened was it step by step by step eventually came to the point where now there's like a physical book that's sitting in front of me three years later, but mm -hmm. there was a lot of trips and turns and detours all along the way to getting a book published and finished and everything. But it wasn't like I was worrying about the entire process. I was going, what is it that's in front of me right now? What's the next 100 feet? I need to go these 100 feet. And once I'm at those 100 feet, I trust that the next 100 feet is going to be lit up. And that's what living in the headlights really looks like, which is you know, the, the phrase, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You can't there go you to step two if you haven't been on step one. You can't be at step 1,000 if you're only on <laughs> step two. And so it's like just one step at a time is really the, the secret that I think people need to take from that. There you go. Wait, your booking agent, uh, you texted him? My booking agent gave like me it? a Snapchat. So anyway, I don't know what yeah, that well. means. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that explains everything, damn it. Uh, no, I love what you said there because, you know, the, the journey, you know, comes from one step at a time. I always call it uh, chew the elephant uh, one bite at a time, you know, take on the elephant. Right. But staring in the headlights uh, in business, I used to call it looking in the mouth of the dragon. And if we could deal with whatever was going to come with that and, and stare down the dragon, then we go for it. And so I love that because, you know, sometimes you don't know how it's going to be, but you've got to take those steps and then eventually it all comes together. And then you reach the point that you're at now where you're like, holy crap, there's a book and we wrote it and we went through the gauntlet of, of hell, hell, fire and damnation. And the great thing is, is your book comes out on October 3rd on October 4th. Everyone's going to say, so what's the next book? 
So watch for that. I know. Well, they already are asking me that. I'm like, listen, they, listen well, not only did it take three yeah, years to great. write, it could have taken three years off the end of my life. And so we'll uh, we'll see. It's going to be some time before the next one comes out. Publicist is like, uh, hey, hey, let's get this market. We got to get this guy working on the next one. It's like Led Zeppelin, yeah. the first three albums or something. Uh, so it, that yeah. leads us into uh, the one thing you have that you talked about where – all we need to accomplish is working to achieve just 1% more every day. And does that play into what we were just talking about? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, I've, I, I first discovered self-development when I was 19. So, you know, mm -hmm. 18 years ago at this point, I'm 37 now. And, um, when I discovered it, it was like, I was, I was trying, I wanted to be so much better. I remember comparing myself when I was like 21, I was like, man, why am I, why am I not rich yet? Like there's so many people there. I was comparing myself to other people and I was like, well, they're so successful. I'm not successful yet. I'm not where I want to be. And a lot of times we do that. Uh, now that I'm 37 years old, I look back and I was like, oh, I was comparing myself to guys that were like 63 years old. They were three times my age. It took <laughs> just takes time for things to mature sometimes, yeah. Yeah. you know? And so with the 1% better, that was actually one of the titles we were thinking about. So it's like, it went from taking action to 1% better to better than yesterday was the, the last title before we went for level up, which is, Instead of, instead of just saying, hey, how can I make massive strides in my life, which we all want, it, mm -hmm. it's compounded. It's just little teeny tiny things every single day. And the idea is super simple. It's how can I just be 1% better today mm -hmm. when I go to bed than when I woke up? And if you're 1% better every single day, the way that it works in math is when you're at 1% better, you're just a little bit better. And then you compound that. And you're just a little bit better on top of it. And when you do the math of 1% of better, over 365 days, that compounds and you're actually approximately 37 times better if you do the compounding on it. And so it's like, mm -hmm. it's like the idea of uh, if, if I give you, would you want a million dollars today or would you want a penny that's doubled every day for the next 30 days? And people are like, I want the million dollars. But you don't realize that if you just have a penny that doubles and gets a little bit better every single day, over the next 30 days, it's going to be end up being, a, I think it was like $9 million, $5 million. Yeah, and so yeah. there's a, it really comes down to like the compounding effect. And my, uh, my grandfather was, uh, was a, uh, he wasn't a super successful guy. He was an engineer, but he was really smart with his money. And, um, you know, he built a successful life from it and, but he was really good with, with money and what to do with it. I remember after he passed away, we were looking through his drawers and, you know, cleaning stuff out. Literally his, his first drawer, you pull it out and right at the top, there was a sticker on top. And it said, if nothing else, just remember that compound interest will always save you. And I was like, damn, this is crazy because wow. things that compound over time are really small as they compound. But if you fast forward 10 years, it's massive. And we think that success is one big massive event, but it's literally a lot of times doing the boring things day in, day out. And that compounds over time and eventually you get to where you want to be. There you go. My dad used to always do the one penny thing back in the day. I don't know really? where he picked it up, but he, he always used to tell people in the day or he'd ask us as kids and we'd be like, I don't you know. We're like kids now. We don't know math. We don't understand what money is. Uh, <laughs> You're like, I don't but, even know how much a million dollars is. Yeah. Like who cares? Eh? I want a toy. Uh, candy. Uh, so, you know, but you're right. These, these small steps, you know, you go on these journeys. I would, I have people that will come to me and they'll be like, <laughs> I want to be like you, Chris. I want to be an entrepreneur. You know, I started my first company. When I was 18 and they're like, oh, I want to do my own business. And I got this idea and I'm like, okay, we'll go do it. And they're like, ah, I got to wait till it's perfect. You know, and that's one of the things you mm. talk in your book about is perfection and kind of the, the fallacies of it. And, uh, and then I'd be like, no, you should really do it now. Cause it's a journey it's, and you do have to live in the headlights. As you say, uh, you've got to go through that gauntlet and it's just, you just got to do it. It's just, it, it's like walking across the desert. You just got to do it. And so, uh, and then I would meet them you know, six months later. I mean, hey, hey, how's the business going? Uh, I'm starting to wait for the perfect, you know, I'm waiting to get everything just perfect right. for it. And now you're like, it'll never be perfect, but uh, have fun with that. And you'll see him years later. How'd that business work out for you? Still waiting for it to be perfect. You know, as right. you said, you've got to take those first steps. You got to go into it. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting about your book was uh, you talked and you mentioned this earlier with the science stuff, neuroplasticity and how mm -hmm. our brains can be rewired. Now, will this work for all six of my personalities too? <laughs> yeah, you can you can use it for all of your personalities. Even yeah, the one it's, that says it's kill, um, kill all the time that the judge says I can't use anymore. Maybe we can get him hey, rewired. They don't know what they're talking about. 
You can do whatever it is that you. This is your life. You can do what you want. You know. That's what personality um, six. With always neuroplasticity, says. it's it's pretty amazing because I think that um, we think that as we get older, like we've heard the phrase over and over again in our lives, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, which mm. is not true in any sort of way. And, and science actually proves that it's not. You can change yourself. You can change your brain. It just takes a lot more time than it used to when you were younger. And mm -hmm. um, neuroplasticity is is the actual showing that the, the phrase means basically that you can change your brain however you want to. And um, it's really interesting because there's a, there's a lot of science like this was people keep asking me like, what's your favorite chapter? And I'm like, might be this one. It might be because oh. there, I, we put so much research into it and, and, and figuring all this out. And there's so many studies that we put into it of people actually changing their brain. And so mm -hmm. like, for instance, there's a thing that, that uh, in order to become a London taxi cab driver, they have to memorize every single street that's in London. And I think it's like 20,000 streets or something like that. Holy crap. And they have to go through this process of memorizing it because it, they've been doing this since before GPSs. So people had to, they didn't know every single street. Mm. And so they did a study on their brain and found out, you know, they did a study right before they, they became a London, London taxi cab driver and three years after. And they actually found that three years later, the spatial recognition parts of their brain that map out areas was larger mm. than it was when they started. And so it actually shows that your brain will change, but it requires a lot of repetition over. There's two ways to really change your brain. Um, mm. There's there's like maladaptive plasticity, which means that maladaptive means like an event happens. It's an extremely heightened emotional event. And, you know, like PTSD would be considered maladaptive plasticity. One event happens, your brain is different. It changes. Uh, mm. my, my best friend was in a car accident and he was T-boned years ago. And the next time he got into a car, he was terrified. And it was, wow. a, it was an immediate thing. It was an immediate shift in his brain and he had to work through it. But that doesn't really happen a whole lot in our lives. The other way to change it is, is adaptive plasticity, which is continuing to show up every single day. So it's either a, a huge event or it is consistency of showing mm -hmm. up every single day. And there's, there's another study that I have inside of the book talking about people who are really expert pianists. Like they sit down, they play the piano and they're really good at it. And they've actually done studies on their brain and they realized that as you become a quote unquote expert pianist and you can play really well when they're soloing, you would think, okay, they're soloing. They, they're not, they're not, they're not playing something that they played over and over and over again. Their brain is going to require more blood flow in order to do that. What's interesting is they've been able to, to play so many times that they're actually kind of mentally able to get out of their way and their brain has less blood flow to the executive function parts of their brain because oh. your brain changes three, there's, there's three, there's a three-step process basically of changing your brain. The first way is chemically. The second way is structurally. And the last way is functionally. So chemically is like, if you've ever sat down and like played the piano and you learn a song real quick and you're like, oh, I'm pretty good at it. That's a, a chemical change, but you can come back tomorrow or in two weeks and you're like, oh damn, I don't remember how to play this anymore. Or you can remember like just parts of it. That's because it was just a, a chemical short-term change. As you continue to keep doing it over and over again, the br your brain actually changes structurally, which is what I was wow. talking about with people who are the London taxi cab drivers. The structure of their brain actually starts to change. And then when you go into functionally, which is the example of the blood flow to the penis brain, the, the function of their brain will actually start to change. And so oh. we can think, oh, I am the way that I am and that's our identity and we can stay that way. And I'll always be this way forever. Or we can go, hey, there's scientific proof that I can change no matter what. Uh, and that's through neuroplasticity. It just requires, number one, it takes, it takes the self-awareness. It takes intention. And it just takes a lot of effort. And a lot of times people just don't want to show up and put the effort in. There you go. Rob just ruined it for all you lazy people. I'm going to throw his book <laughs> yeah. at you anytime you say to me, I, I right. am what I am, Popeye. Or was it Popeye who said that? I don't know. So there you go. Uh, yeah, this is pretty cool. The science of uh, the science of your brain, and it can help people expand their identity. Uh, one last thing that mm -hmm. I, I thought was interesting to tease out: dopamine reward systems. Now, how much cocaine mm -hmm. is involved in this? <laughs> well, I can actually well. talk about cocaine if you want. So this is also inside no, the book as well. It's like <laughs> it's perfect. It works perfect. So. Uh, let me talk about dopamine real quick. So a lot of people think that dopamine and serotonin, they usually like put them together. So serotonin is the both dopamine and, and serotonin are both feel good chemicals in your brain. Serotonin is more of like a gratitude, feeling good for where you currently are. Mm -hmm. Dopamine is being motivated. It's an external chemical. It's being motivated for, to go and do something. And so okay. dopamine, for instance, uh, if you look at it, if you're, if you're highly motivated, what they call that in, in, um, 
in neuroscience is that is a high dopamine state if you're highly motivated. If you are demotivated today, you are in what's called a low dopamine state. And so when you look at somebody like you just said, like cocaine, for instance, when you do cocaine, you uh, are 250%, your, your dopamine levels spike 250%. And wow. so the ones that have like the, the craziest drugs that you think of, like the people that are most motivated to go get it again, guess mm -hmm. what type of drug they are. They're they are high dopamine chemicals that they're really working with there. And so when you look at the dopamine reward system, this is, it's funny because these are the two chapters that are my favorite. I don't know which one's a favorite between the two of them because it's neuroplasticity and then it goes to dopamine reward system. And dopamine reward system, I was so excited to put this into a book because I was like, if people can use this and learn it, this could 100% absolutely change your life. And it's how to use understanding what dopamine is and understanding that dopamine is 100% subjective as well. It, it can be very subjective. So hmm. I can basically celebrate myself for anything and my brain will release a little bit of dopamine, which makes me then want really? more. Like we're dopamine fiends. We want more dopamine. And here's what happens is you take dopamine reward systems and you ask yourself, okay, like if I want to... Let's go back to the same way, the same thing you said before, lose 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. The way I used to be when I was younger was I will not be happy until I accomplish X. I'll be pissed off. I'll be mad at myself. I won't be happy until I accomplish X. And when I'm happy when I accomplish X is the only time that my brain in that process is dop letting dopamine into my brain. So mm -hmm. it's actually holding back the most important chemical for the motivation. Ah. So instead of going, and that's what I call that inside the book, I call a results-based goal. My goal is based off of results, which are important to have. But what you do is you make a results-based goal and then you, you create action-based goals based off of that. And so an action-based goal could, could be, so if the results-based goal is I don't lose 50 pounds, the action-based goal is I can celebrate myself when I walk into the gym because I didn't want to be here today. That's going to release dopamine. It's going to want to make me keep going. I can celebrate myself after every single set that I do and allow my brain to release dopamine multiple times which actually starts to get me addicted to the process mm. of getting to that results-based goal. Like if you look at, uh, I talk about Kobe Bryant inside of the book. Mm -hmm. Kobe Bryant is, is known for being somebody who would work out almost every single day since he was in high school at 4 a.m. And mm -hmm. uh, his, his trainer, who also trained Michael Jordan, uh, Tim Grover, said the hardest thing to get Kobe to do was to stop because he was mm. just so driven. And so I don't think he did this on purpose, but there's many times when I was researching him where he would talk about how proud he was of the fact that he was working out knowing that his competition was sleeping, knowing that he was putting in the work when they weren't. And so what happened was instead of getting two workouts a day, like they, an average uh, basketball player does, they wake up, they do one at like 10, they do one at you know two and they get their two workouts. He got three in. He knew every single day he was going to be 50% better than them. And if you multiply oh. that over 10 years, no one can compete. And so he set up a dopamine reward system, probably unconsciously, of celebrating himself as soon as he gets done with the workout to want to show up for the next workout. And his pride in himself made him release dopamine and then want to show up the next day and to continue to keep doing it. So it's always really important to have goals and to have results-based goals, which is the long-term ones. But after mm -hmm. you set those, what's really important is actually the, the short-term action-based goals. There you go. And, and like we talked about earlier, you talked about earlier, you know, doing the, doing the short stuff and doing the daily stuff, you know, uh, going to the gym every day. Hey, good job. Hey, going, you know, and you wake up one day and then it's compounded and you've got these great results uh, for your long-term goal, as you mentioned. I like how you've built the book around this gamification mindset, because a lot of, a lot of people now, you know, they know if it's gamification, especially if you're a man, you play video games, uh, everywhere you go, there's gamification. So, is gamification probably a good analogy uh, of, of how you've set up and pitched the book? Yeah. I mean, I think that I, it's, it's more fun to me. Like I grew up playing sports. It's more fun to just think of everything as a game, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything is more fun. The, 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 the whole idea of this being a video game that we're playing, you know, it's like uh, people always talk about, if you look at like Elon Musk talking about like the simulation theory where it's like, mm -hmm. We are humans in this, but maybe we're actually just video game characters in this crazy hyper reality thing that we're that we're in this crazy virtual reality. Maybe that's true. Maybe that's not. I don't know. I'm not smart enough to know those things. But I like <laughs> to make everything into a game because it makes it more fun. You know, it yeah. makes it it makes it more fun to have a win or lose. It makes it more fun to be able to celebrate yourself for showing up. And um, B.J. Fogg, who I talk about in the book, he wrote a book called Tiny Habits, and um, 
he's like, you can basically gamify any of this stuff. And mm-hmm. he says, there's a, a, you know, the, the, the way that you can do it, that's very easy is you can take your habits that you currently have that are, are normal habits. And you can take the habit that you want and put it on the back end of that. And it's called mm-hmm. habit stacking. So you take an old habit, you put your new habit on top of it and you do them at the same time. So like, for instance, let's say somebody, somebody wants to start doing a hundred pushups a day, right? And they're like, I'm going to go do a hundred pushups a day. You could force yourself to schedule it and figure out where you want to put it in your day. Or you could take something that's already a habit and you could put it on the back end of it. So for instance, hopefully everybody who's listening to this brush their teeth in the morning, in the evening. So you could say, when I brush my teeth, I'll do 50 pushups. And so in the morning, when I brush my teeth, I do 50 pushups in the evening. When I do it, when I brush my teeth, I do 50 pushups. Boom. I just got hundred pushups done, which is my habit that I was working for can actually be accomplished without having to schedule new time to do it. And then at the end of it, the thing he talks about is, is the important part is celebrating yourself. And mm-hmm. it's, it sounds, I get it. It sounds like for someone who's like a hard worker and analytical, it sounds corny to be like, yay, I did it. Good job, Rob. Like that seems real corny, but actually like just sitting there and feeling pride and doing the thing that you didn't want to do or taking yourself one step closer is, is just a, a way to set up a dopamine reward system to make yourself want to show up and do it again tomorrow. There you go. You should sell a controller with the book, you know, like a little game controller. Yeah, I should, right? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, people people don't seem to like controllers after that whole Titanic thing that happened. And the, uh, the guy oh, yeah, that's uh, that sub, didn't, that didn't work. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably a bad idea, you know. But, you know, the controller, you know, I can be like, hey, hit that neural neuroplasticity button. And then all that good stuff. So there you go. Uh, final thoughts as we go out. Uh, I'll leave it to you, Rob. Uh, pitch the book and and uh, all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, th- as far as the book goes, if once again, if it's it's not a self development book, it is like a step by step manual for how to get yourself from where you are now to where you want to go. And so, if anybody wants to buy it, it's it's level up. It's everywhere you can buy a book. What's cool about it is it's it's on pre sale right now, and it's already uh, hit number one in psychology neurobiology. Nice. It's at number one, entrepreneurship, business, and uh, education as well. And so it's, it's already out there. It's doing pretty well. I'm, I'm proud of it for, for what it's done. And, um, and so if somebody wants a step-by-step process, that's the best way to do it. And then somebody likes listening to podcasts like yours, obviously, wherever they listen to podcasts, they can listen to mine, which is a mindset mentor. And, you know, they can, uh, they can listen to me there and, uh, and follow it. And I put out four episodes every single week and all of them are based around mindset because, if you look at the basis of everything, it always comes back to the way that you're thinking about stuff. And so for me, it's just my place where I like to serve and try to help people as much as I possibly can. And uh, it's it's been a journey. It's been a beautiful thing. And I'm 1,400 podcast episodes in, which I think we're right about the same. You think you're right yeah. about 1,400 as well? Yeah. And so uh, so so we got a lot. And, and what's funny about that too is I had a lady come up to me the other day and I was at an event. She came up to me and she's like, hey, I, I follow your podcast and I just started a podcast like a week ago. She's like, what's the biggest tip you can give me? Cause she's like, I, I heard yours is one of the top 100 in the world. How do I get to one of the top 100 in the world? I said, here's what I want you to do. You ready for the next eight years? I want you to put out four episodes a week. <laughs> and then I want you to talk to me because people always want like the, the secret sauce. Right. And it's like, mm-hmm. I'm sure you, Chris are better now then you were in the very first episode. Like I listened oh, to my very yeah. first episode and I kind of cringe a little bit sometimes short, but it's like you only get better from actually doing the thing. Everybody sure. wants like the secret sauce and how do I get myself to do it? I'm like, just put in the work. That's what you have to do. And yeah. so that's what the, uh, the podcast has been for me. Put in that 1% every day, you know, just like you're, that's right. like you're saying as 80% of podcasts fail by episode seven, because people give up and the, yeah, that's actually, you're, provide... what's funny. You're the only other person that's tell me that statistic. I, I actually, mm-hmm. when I started my podcast, I had heard that most people give up by episode mm-hmm. seven. And yep. so when I started the podcast, I recorded 14 before I put it out. Cause I said, I'll try 14. If it works, there it works, go. but at least I did double what the average person yeah. did. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And it started go. getting movement and I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to keep doing this thing. Good job. The, the other 20% that survive, uh, 80% of the 20% will die by episode 20 to 25, especially if it doesn't have its own .com. So, uh, you know, I've really? had people come out to me and they're like, I'm a top 2% podcaster. I'm like, how many podcasts do you have? 100? How many downloads do you have per, like 200? you know per episode and, and i'm like that's because 97% of this business is like zombie podcasts so uh yeah, good advice there's, uh, there's like 2 million podcasts and i think there's like mm-hmm. 200,000 are actually still doing it so it's like 90% yeah. are already 
gone. They're already dead. Yeah. They're just happen yeah. to still live on 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 iTunes because nobody deleted them. You know. Yeah, I got it on authority that uh, Anchor has like half a million dead zombie podcasts on it. They're just really and yeah, they're just abandoned carts. They're just running around there, not doing nothing. Um, I call them zombie right. podcasts. So there you go. Uh, it, it's been wonderful you have on the show, Rob, and you're inspiring people. You're getting people to level up, and, and I like how you figured out a way to really get people to motivate themselves. Because there's nothing worse than you're just like, oh, I'll celebrate it when I lose a hundred pounds, or I'll celebrate it when I get this. You know, you you can use it as a way to motivate yourself to tell self to get there. Uh, final dot coms as we go out for where people can look you up on the interwebs. Yeah, robdial.com. So it's R O B D I A L dot com. And then I'm everywhere that 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 stuff is. So like if they like Instagram, I'm on Instagram. If I'm on if someone's on TikTok, I'm on TikTok, YouTube. I'm in all of the places. If someone just types in Rob Dial, I'm I'm gonna pop up usually wherever they are. There you go. Thank you very much, Rob, for coming on. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. There you go. And uh, to our audience, order the book wherever fine books are sold. You can get a pre-sale at October. Third, 2023, it will be hitting the bookshelves live. Level up how to get focused, stop procrastinating, and upgrade your life by Rob Dial. I get it. Well, the book's uh, coming hot off the shelves and order up spares for uh, Christmas. It's always good to have this gift to give away. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. We love you. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, go to uh, goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Voss, TikTok, Chris Voss One. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>